All right. Welcome, everyone. It looks like we've got almost everybody in here. Wonderful. Um, we're going to get started pretty promptly here this evening, um, just because we've got our one hour schedule and we're going to try to stick with that. So I'm going to begin by just adjusting one of my windows so I can read my text. Awesome. All right. So Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Mueller, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Welcome to our summer furniture and social practice conference. Um, I'm going to start out with a visual description of myself in case we have anyone with low vision participating this evening. I am a late 30s woman with brown hair, brown eyes. I am uh, sitting in a uh, sort of office studio space here. And um, I am wearing a green shirt with pink earrings. And and I missed, I'm a white woman. I forgot to say that part. Um, and uh, tonight it is my pleasure to start off our activities with a land acknowledgement um, to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory. This is the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. And gathering here, we pay our respects to those elders, both past and present. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but very uh, racist laws that have segregated all people. So we honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience. And if you'd like to learn more about land acknowledgements, feel free to screenshot um, this slide and find out one, which lands are you occupying? And also, if you'd like to learn more about land and acknowledgements in general. This link here um, from the US Department of Arts and Culture gives really great background um, for investigating that yourself. Um, so tonight's event is sponsored by the MFA program. And if you're curious about us, check out our link. Um, we've got a ton of great info online. We are a community of makers, thinkers, uh, researchers, creative professionals, and we're working in a mentor-based interdisciplinary environment. So check that out. Um, also, some technical notes for this evening. Your audio will be muted, um, and if you experience any a, uh, AV technical challenges tonight, you can email us at av underscore support at mcad.edu. Um, please feel free if any questions come up as our speakers are, are uh, speaking or presenting or talking to each other, uh, put those in the chat and we will try to get to those if we have time at the end. Um, also, a recording of this webinar will be made available to um, MCAD students and the, the larger world after the event is concluded. And tonight, we must say thanks. We have so much gratitude to our amazing support. Um, thank you very much to Erin Morin, our co-conference organizer. Um, she's an amazing furniture faculty member here at MCAD. Um, thank you also to our fantastic staff. We have Seth Dahlside, we have Kylie Van Note, Nikki Modicolum, and tonight um, we are joined by Pearl Davis, who is our live tech support. We are so, so grateful. Um, and also, we have to acknowledge our incredible sponsors. Um, these folks made this event possible. We've got the American Craft Counselor, uh, Craft Council, not Counselor, um, Rockler, uh, the Furniture Society, and also Tandem Made, shout out to Erin, that's her company, uh, Rippin and Blue Dot, who have all generously contributed to this event. And tonight, it is my honor to introduce our fantastic speakers. Um, first, we'll be joined by Arzu Ozkal, then Kelsey Sharp, and then Carolyn Willard. Um, each will be giving a three to five minute presentation so audience members can get a sense of each panelist's background and work. And then we'll move into prepared questions for this panel. Um, and like I said, if there's time at the end, we would love to uh, grab your questions and pose those as well. So feel free to be busy in the chat. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Arzu. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen. Can you all see? Yes, it looks great. My little baby. All right. Um, and can you see it go to the next slide too? Yes. Okay, great. 
So hello, everybody. Um, I'm Arzu Oskel. I'm a white woman in my uh, mid 40s. Uh, I'm with gray and dark straight hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Turkish. I'm currently living and working in San Diego, California. However, at this very moment, I'm in Yosemite, um, which I just looked at the link that you shared. Um, it's the Miwok territory. Um, so I'm in a very simple um, hotel room, nothing excited, but the view is uh, pretty darn amazing. Um, yeah, so I am a social practice artist coming from um, graphic design background. I'm not a furniture designer, so I have to say I'm super excited to be here, but I'm also um, a little bit intimidated to be presenting um, at a furniture conference. Um, however, I'm really, really excited about this project and sharing this project with you all. Um, and to me, design is really creating objects or concepts to improve people's uh, present day lives. So I think and I hope I am doing that with my work. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, Artsit, a project of Home Affairs Art Collective, um, a collective that I co-founded in 2012 uh, with my colleague and dear friend Nanette Yanuzi from Ohio. Um, Home Affairs is more of a coalition, however, um, because we do collaborate with um, people from all across disciplines um, uh, whenever needed for various projects. So Artsit is an um, assistive device, a high chair like furniture for use by families and caregivers in museum and um, galleries. So um, it developed from an earlier project um, a photography series about mother artists. So with that project, we asked the question, does your gallery, museum, conference center, or festival provide childcare? Um, we showcase mother artists from all generations, and our goal was to create a frame for dialogue around what the art world could do to improve experiences um, of caregivers within the art world. I'm a mother of two, and my... Um, project partner or uh, my friend Manette is also a mother and her children were already 20 um, or in college uh, when I had my first baby. And even they were like 20 years apart, our experiences were quite similar. And our experience of navigating the art world was, you know, shockingly similar. So it was around that time, the New York Times article, Can Women Have It All, came out and Lynette was, you know, we were talking on the phone constantly, like, I can't believe people are still discussing this. So we have to, you know, create um, a project basically showcasing women, um, mother artists um, who have, you know, contributing, continuing to their careers successfully. Um, they don't have to choose one or the other. So after participating in, the, in an exhibition entitled The Let Down Reflex, uh, curated by Amber Burson and Juliana Driver, um, and the whole exhibition was basically focusing on caregiving within the art world. We, the Home Affairs Collective, we decide, we started receiving emails from um, art institutions, galleries, museums. So like, tell us what we could do to improve these conditions for, you know, caregivers, uh, mother artists, uh, women artists. And so we compiled a list. We were sharing it with them when they asked us, you know, from very simple changes to, you know, more um, maybe complex structural changes. But we really wanted to contribute something solid and say, okay, if you do this, like the, the you will really help these people. You will be a lot more inclusive and welcoming. So we really um, wanted to create something solid. So what we do as our collective, we organize workshops, uh, we invite women and caregivers to talk about their experiences. Um, we collect, you know, stories from them. And this is from Barbara Phillip, an Amsterdam based multimedia artist, you can read the whole thing. This is a whole story, but I'm just gonna very quickly read she wants to go um, to an opening of her friend, it's rainy outside, she has two kids on a bike. So she just says here, she even proposed 
me to stay with the kids for 10 minutes so I am able to go inside and see the exhibition. So it's always a struggle for um, caregivers to take their young children to an opening, um, to see an exhibition, because it's never a welcoming environment, sadly, um, for many reasons. So we started like looking into why um, or what we can actually do to improve these conditions. So I also document my own child. This is my first um, born. So I am an artist. I, whenever I go to a new city, obviously, I like to see museums, exhibitions, and I take him with me. So he gets bored, he can't see the work. So he likes to explore these other things, jump on the couch and we don't let him. So he cries and you know, we have to leave the space. And why? Um, we started noticing, observing behaviors of children, right? So everything is displayed at, you know, minimum 57 inches. So they can't really see, like all, everything is displayed. This is the archeological museum in um, Turkey. So Grown-ups, adults can see everything comfortably. Children have nothing to see. They see body parts and the, you know, podiums that the artwork or the objects are displayed. We were one day sitting at a coffee shop with my colleague Nanette and talking about like, what can we do? What can we do? So we, we just looked around. There were children with families. None of them were throwing tantrums. They were all happily, you know, engaged, sitting at the table around face-to-face -face with their families. And we also realized that all the, you know, grocery stores, big box stores, they all supply caregivers, parents with um, shopping carts. This is a Home Depot. This is very famous, you know. Um, kids love getting on this car and like shopping with their um, parents. So this is, you know, provided you don't even question going into these places that will there be a high chair or will I be able to put my child on a stroller? So we decided that it's time for the art world to lift up their youngest visitors and future members. So we started sketching, thinking, what do kids like? They like rocking horses, they like carousels, and a high chair is something very familiar to them because you know we all go to restaurants and they all sit in one, so it's not a scary, intimidated object. So we came up with this idea, uh, we called it Art Sit. Um, apparently, it's one of the biggest spelling errors that kids make when they are spelling artist. So it's a play on that. Um, so it's a stroller like um, or high chair stroller like furniture that we hope that all museums would adapt. So adapt so that, you know, when you when you take your young child to a museum or gallery, you put your child in it you comfortably experience the space, the artwork. This is our first prototype. Um, we just to test the structure. So we piloted this in various places. This is uh, the Queens Museum. Uh, we had a weekend, it is the open engagement um, event. So we invited mother, uh, the parents to bring their kids. Um, the experience was lovely. You can see kids like pointing at different work. They are happy, they're excited. Their hands are busy holding the horse so they're not trying to grab the artwork. Um, and the premise of this furniture, the horse is like for museums, we are working with them with Toledo Museum right now that if they have a, a, a animal figure within their private collections, we can customize the horse so it could be um, an educational um, component for the exhibition. And I'm going to end with this beautiful cartoon from Linda Berry. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but you can probably take a couple seconds to um, just, just read it yourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arzu. I'm going to give it a second, just in case okay. people are reading, because it's a good cartoon. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was really You're great. Welcome. All right, next we'll hand it over to Kelsey Sharp. There we go. I see it coming up on the screen. Wonderful. Oh, and Kelsey, you are muted right now. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Hi, y'all. I am Kelsey Sharp. Um, I am an African-American female. I'm just going to describe myself. Um, I have a shaved head and I look kind of boyish and, and super charming. Um, I'm sitting in um, also a hotel room and um, I'm in Portland right now and I um, live in Minneapolis um, and I identify as a female. Um, so yeah, um, that was like so incredible to hear you speak on um, your work, Arzu. And I feel like we have so many um, parallels because I think um, I don't really come to today's conversation with um, a furniture design background either, but I really come at every single um, approach as like I run um, a design build shop and we predominantly focus on signage design, but really every single um, project that I take on, I'm kind of like approaching it as how do I design and build and brand this experience, which I think is so, so um, similar to um, what you were saying just now, like when you're saying um, tying to each piece of the private collection and making um, making the chair specific to each museum, like I would I would do that same thing and I would use like slightly different words to describe um, what I'm doing, but it's like it's there. So yeah, I run Sharp Sign Company um, and I um, am just going to kind of like run through some images that'll just be like um, an amuse-bouche for the conversation. And I think that I'll just say that one of the things that I'm really interested in um, is emphasizing the process as well as the end result and being really transparent and revealing about the process. Um, and one of the things that I think is so interesting about um, who we are here tonight as three panelists is like the fact that we're all um, femme identifying um, humans. And I think that one of the reasons why I'm so interested in the process by which we arrive at the end product is because I feel like um, women and femmes have intentionally been excluded from that part of this um, for, for so long. So I think we see a lot of women Arzu in, in um, the design world, but then it is like, how do we take this, this project through the product development and the prototyping phases? And so I get like really, really excited about that. Um, so on the screen are a few images. Um, they're all me. And um, one of them is me, um, in the top kind of sanding some wood and then I'm working on a piece of hand painted signage um, and then bottom just um, being my playful self. Um, so then here's some more pictures of me too. And um, on the left, I am working with um, a piece of fabrication machinery that's a plasma cutter. So that's used to cut, um, it's one of many ways that you can cut steel and other metals. Um, and then on the right, I'm um, holding a piece of artwork um, of my creation. And that is created using a very similar machine, but for wood, CNC router. Um, you guys probably, you um, might be familiar with some of this machinery, so. Um, and then, yeah, so these are just kind of like me revealing to you how I'm interested in celebrating the process. These are, um, and just kind of like if I, if I could talk about how I come to each project from this very, very experimental and like celebration of the process lens. And then also to um, really thinking about things in, um, in, um, the context of I really get excited by working with stuff that has a temporary application. Um, so like this, these kind of next few slides are um, something that I built um, over uh, last September. And it was, you know, obviously during the pandemic. So it was kind of the concept of um, 
eyebrows raised at our zoo. It was kind of the concept of how do we bring the museum outside because it was not, it was kind of in the time where it wasn't really acceptable to, I mean, depending on your comfort level, to be inside of a museum, but people were still making art and, and wanting to um, reveal that to people. So we made this kind of whole um, outdoor installation. I work on a lot of, um, a lot of projects that have a, a certain uh, abbreviated lifespan like this one, which was up for like probably two weeks. Um, and so just to describe those photos to you, they are plywood with um, type on them. And then um, it was a photography exhibit. So there's a lot of um, emphasis on the artist's photography, which is um, Diana Albrecht, who's also a Minneapolitan. Um, and so then I think too, I like to build in a way that's very like, I, I spent a lot of time in um, the architecture department when I was at university. And so I like to build in a way that is like really thinking about things as installations and really thinking about things as like creating um, an immersive experience. Um, so all that's just kind of like my approach. So it's like, for example, when I'm um, when a sign when a sign client comes to me and they're opening a new business, um, you know they might say, "Oh, we need a sign for our business," and I'm like, "Okay, we're gonna do a site survey because it's like, okay, does you know there's there's often a sign package um, where there's you know a consideration of perpendicular, parallel, you know, a survey of like the neighborhood, and there's there's a really like um, a holistic approach that I like to take to every single project. Like I'm not gonna um, design a sign without understanding the context in which it's gonna exist. Um, and then I think, oh yep, yeah, and that's me with the same um, installation that I did. So this was one where a client came to me and they were basically like, can you um, do some, you know, some posters for us with our like core values on them? And it's like, yeah, I could like put integrity on the wall, but like, you know, what do we do to like make it a little bit um, more for your folks? You know, if you're going to make something that's for your um, folks, how do we kind of like bring them into the conversation and make something that reflects um, where they're at? And so this was kind of the culmination of that little sign project. Um, and then I think, um, like one of the things that's been really interesting about my client base um, is that I work with a lot of mission driven and social justice organizations. Um, and that has like totally um, as uh, that has totally also defined my approach to my work. Um, and I can speak um, more on that later. But yeah, I'm so I'm so appreciative to be here tonight. Thanks for having me, Ellen. Absolutely. That was so great to hear more about your background. I love it. Um, and last but not least, Caroline, would you like to share? Hey, yeah, good to see a lot of people here. Thank you, Arzu and Kelsey. This is great. I think we'll have a lot to talk about. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, you see my name. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yep. So yeah, let me start with a visual description. I am a white woman in my late 30s. I have longish brown hair for me and I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm in a space in Berlin. And because we're using Zoom, I like to say that we're also implicated in their headquarters in San Jose, California on the land of the Moaca people. So let's continue to think about the Zoom space that we're in as well. And I'm going to give a very brief overview because I like getting into the conversation part. So especially those of you in the Zoom that I see you visited us, thank you for being present and joining. I think we can have a great talk together. And yeah, I make furniture like the other presenters, not as a furniture designer primarily. 
It's important for me that the objects I make come along with systems. So I think a lot as an interdisciplinary artist about how the objects I make can circulate in the world. And often that means creating systems, whether it's a barter network, a mutual aid system, a research collaborative, an advocacy coalition. I'd be happy to talk about any of that in the Q&A. And I do this in a range of ways. A lot of them are sculptural. So connecting objects to systems with printed matter. Here there's an image of currency that I made for the Museum of Modern Art to circulate the desires and demands of visitors in 2014. With websites, we can talk a lot about online networks if people are interested. And with a real love of sculptural objects that often look like and are furniture, the topic of today. In uh, installation with collaborative invitations for people to join each of these endeavors. And here you see an image of an installation and someone using the currency at MoMA. I thought I would talk a little bit about this queer rocker that I designed and many people have made around the world. This is Zoe at this amazing space called We Make in Milan, who runs that space sitting in the asphalt space around the makerspace in Milan. And here are two other images of the rocker. Essentially, it's one piece of plywood, four by eight, that gets cut out so that all of the scrap is then used to create the furniture system. And it can be attached with a ratchet strap or with hardware or with press fitted joints like you see here. And many people have adapted it. This is an image of a student at Cornell and people using it at SUNY Purchase where they also adapted it. So this is connected to my interest in systems and the way that objects can circulate in the world. Often this object is in student run spaces, queer spaces, and spaces that organizers are using for their meetings. In thinking about what furniture can do, I'm reminded of what Sarah Ahmed wrote that queer furnishing is not such a surprising formulation. The word furnish is related to the word perform and thus relates to the very question of how things appear. Queer becomes a matter of how things appear, how they gather, how they perform to create edges of spaces and worlds. So for me, this rocking chair is queer because it's also a dividing wall, a window, a table, and a chair. It's queer because its holes become its strength, literally, and its structure, and because it makes the politics of its own production visible. Here are other pieces I thought I would show just to start thinking about what furniture can do, literally and metaphorically. This is an image of a column that can be broken apart and used as a stacking stool. This is an image of furniture that becomes part of a wall structure that is a library in an exhibition that I curated and designed the furniture for. And I thought I'd also show this table that is based on the she-wolf that raised Romulus and Remus. So here it's a cherry wood slab with steel bent legs and ceramic udders that are distended with a mirror for a face looking back at you. And they connect together in a pentagon of five tables with a timekeeping device, a bowl that sinks into the top of the table to mark intervals of time. So I'm going to move through this just to get a sense of the range of furniture that I have made. All of these exist within an installation 
within a larger system that is often collaborative and interdisciplinary. So you can see I really love spaces to hide in. Often there's a lot of reading materials connected to this. Um, this is a rolling table that was also part of the exhibition at MoMA. And more recently, I made this modular table that displays objects like a mycelium bust, a book, and cushions. It's a um, slotted system so that all of the components can move. And the net that is there actually fits into a ceiling tile and is a way to disrupt meetings. My current obsession is with ways to make meetings more compelling on Zoom and in person. So yeah, I'll put a link in the chat about the process of making this work if people are interested. And I'm so excited to be in dialogue with you all. Thanks for organizing this, Erin and Ellen. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was fantastic. And there was some new work in there that I hadn't seen. So that's always exciting. Um, so for folks, our, our next step here is I've got a few prepared questions um, that I'm going to pose. And it would be great, panelists, if you want to jump in and we can just sort of round robin um, as people's impressions come to them. Um, to themselves, rather. And then also, I would encourage um, and anyone from, from the audience, if you have um, things you'd like to um, add or, or questions you'd like to pose, both Aaron and I, we can watch the chat and um, be ready to interject and, and bring that to the discussion. So um, the first question that we have here is, this is a big one. What is the purpose or meaning of furniture to you. <laughs> so I'd be really interested to hear what our three panelists think about this. And feel free, if you feel moved, just jump in. Should we go in a particular order? No, go for it, Arzu. Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, I have to be honest, until we worked on the, the museum furniture, furniture didn't really have, you know, obviously I use it every day. I put my glass on it and I sit on it, but I did not really think too much about it. Um, but since we started developing this, um, we are, you know, looking at a lot of institutions and organizations like especially like big museums um, how they define set the tone of their space um, either inclusive or very exclusive and sometimes even hostile um, so that 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 was really interesting discovery to me um, then I decided like I started looking at other like restaurants for example how they become very political in a way that they don't include that um, changing table like some restaurants and you know places stores um, they have it in you know we can talk about the the gendered bathroom spaces, like it's problematic in its own way. However, you know, how they only install that furniture into the, the ladies' bathroom, right? So my partner was never able to change even though he wanted to. So like the way that we use furniture, utilize or not utilize furniture could be a very political um, a social stand or an expression of that um, statement. So that was a very interesting eye-opening experience for me um, about furniture and how institutions utilize it. Thanks for that, Arzu. I love that you picked up on that thread because it seems so strong after hearing all three of you talk that the political nature of furniture is, is very present in, right. in all of your works, so. Totally, and I think like, one of the things that furniture and objects that we design can can do is kind of like disarm us as the designers of them because like I'm designing this based on um, my perception of the world and my values and then like you know and it's 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 the same with architecture and and design it's like you know we design the flow or we design the object to be used in a certain way and then actually like the audience reveals to you what they need by how they use it and it's like just like always just like such a 
a funny um, experience. And I'm sure that a lot of some of that is like um, being revealed in the product development phase for you, I imagine, Arzu. Um, but it's just like, I think it can be very revealing of, you know, culture. And I think right now we're kind of in this super, super um, introspective phase of society where we're thinking about, we're thinking really critically in a way that past generations probably haven't of what the ramifications are of everything we create. And for me, I'm so like, if this is the one thing that they, that they find, like, what does that say about us? <laughs> That's great. That's such a poignant point for this moment in general. Um, yeah, I think for me, coming from a visual art and conceptual art background, furniture is often a way to refer to the body, to the participant. I like, Arzu, what you were showing with that um, comic at the end and the experience. Absolutely. Like, my baby would love that. And we do have a huge problem in museums of wanting to uh, invite participation, but not having enough access on so many levels. So yeah, I think conceptually and physically, it refers to that absent presence of the body. And there's this term metonymy that I I'm really moved by. And it's when something stands in for something else, you know, like if we say, um, the White House, but we mean the president. So many artists use, let's say, like boots or shoes, activists do this also to stand in for the body. And I think chairs um, both invite access and participation, but they also stand in for the body in a really helpful way. Such a good point. Excellent. And I want to also for our audience point out, Caroline posted this question into the chat as well. Feel free to add in, join in, jump. <laughs> We're more than happy to have a really interactive um, chat today, but I'll keep going. We've got our second question this evening is, what opportunity do you see for using furniture concepts to reach a broader audience? And I think you've all touched on this, but I don't know if you wanna go in with some more specificity. anyone? <laughs> I can hop in. Yeah, I okay. guess for me, it's like, um, people might feel that the social norms of visual art spaces like galleries and museums are so elite and unaccessible and actually are designed to make people not want to be in them, like especially norms of silence, norms of like distance. Um, all kinds of norms that feel like um, surveillance and security. And for me, there is a way that furniture is recognizable as a space to hopefully be comfortable in and be able to take time in. And so the rush and the norms of space, especially galleries and museums, um, moving the viewer along and not allowing a space that's comfortable or for rest and contemplation, um, doesn't seem like it should be unconventional, but somehow there really isn't a lot of furniture in those spaces. So it's always been fun for me to make furniture in addition to other things to immediately watch people sit down and immediately be able to talk to each other or slow down and shift the flow. Such a great observation about those spaces. I love that idea. Yeah, I think I, I can continue with with that space too, like museum and art galleries. Um, seems like all, you know, all the major museums state that, you know, they would like to engage communities, their communities and, you know, uh, be as inclusive as possible. But it is certainly true that there's definitely that elitist tone. And I think it's definitely created and expressed with the furniture. Um, so with slight changes or major changes, I think they could really invite different communities to be a part, feel more um, 
like part of that space other than just a quick visit um, to see an artwork and leave. Um, so yeah, I think diff like in, uh, getting their communities, broadening their communities, I think it's really important and you can, we can establish that with furniture. Totally. And I think I have been thinking like really critically about um, how to like incorporate accessibility into spaces, especially right now as I'm um, building out my first kind of like more public facing studio space. And how do we how do we incorporate that in a way that doesn't feel like a footnote? Like when you talk about the changing table in the women's restroom, I feel like I see um, that footnote a lot um, added to furniture and design spaces around wheelchair access. And I think like there's there's a lot of really interesting opportunities to make furniture concepts more accessible in a way that isn't performative. And for me, um, like can minimize the differences um, between people um, and and also like, you know, celebrate them and just like, instead of just highlighting them in a way that's like, here's this like sterile like condition that we all agree upon is like, and I think one of the things there too, for me in building out this space is not just thinking about what is ADA compliant, but what is actually good. Like we don't need to do the bare minimum to create access for people. We need to really create like beautifully um, designed spaces um, for a large variety of bodies um, is kind of like one of the many things that I think that I'm thinking about. Um, Another thing that I'm thinking about often as a theme is like sustainability, right? And how um, there was like this slow factory lecture where they were just kind of like talking about how um, sustainability is not buying something new. So as people who are like trying to create new objects in this time, how do we like reconcile that with our responsibilities um, to um, a dumpster fire of a planet? Thank you, Kelsey. That's such a good point. And also coincidentally ties in beautifully with this last comment in the chat, which is coming from Reagan Golden. You're talking about accessibility and um, she's bringing up a very specific piece of furniture um, from the classroom, which is the podium. And as a woman of five foot one inches, she's mentioning that it doesn't fit. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. And so how to um, how to how to deal with with these things that are not built for everyone in every way. Um, so I, I think that's really, really fascinating. And I also want to acknowledge um, Michael Lagan um, left a comment and um, Caroline added there. I didn't know, if, Caroline, if you wanted to add anything further in your response or. Uh, yeah, this is maybe related. It was, Michael, you can also ask more if you want to ask from other people, but it's about queer identity and the implications of binaries and how people engage with the furniture. Yeah, and I was, saying thank you for that and that um yeah often it's a group who approaches me they email me and they say we want to make this and so then we find a maker space or a school fab lab that can support and then everyone adapts the design so there is a feeling of play and um yeah a real ability to modify things when you're doing it yourself and I think because of that, people are really open to performing with their queer rockers in all kinds of ways. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks for the really great question, Michael, and the response, Caroline. Um, so the, I'm going to combine the last two questions that we have, which is the first one is, how can we use this medium as a form of problem solving? And then also, and you can pick if you want to just address like part of this. What are your dreams for using this medium to reach a broader audience? Or you can mishmash them. Feel free to remix. That's fine. 
Oh, okay. I'll start. I feel like one of my, one of my big goals in what I'm trying to do in the world is to kind of bring this, like, which I, I'm like, so elated that I get to make myself aware of your work, Caroline. Um, is I want to bring this kind of like editorial and fine art um, level of design that is often only seen in well-funded spaces like museums and galleries to all of these mission-driven and social justice organizations that I work with because I feel like I see, you know, I see the museum and gallery aesthetic and then I see the nonprofit aesthetic and like how do we how do we create you know beautiful modular and uh, you know stuff in a way that isn't performative and doesn't make these um, you know nonprofits feel like they're um, giving up their martyr status but they can have you know beautiful objects so I think I think that all of that is like a part of my um, aspiration and I also think like. Um, you know, when when we start to like go back to like the the greats, there's kind of like for me th this return to like the original values of like what I think like like mid century modern, for example. You know, Ray and Charles Eames wanted to create something that was um, also economical at the time that it was created. Right? It's not now, um, but at the time it was economical, and so I think that that's a big um, aspiration of mine is how do we do this in a way that it like makes sense financially. Nice. So I think, I think like what we're talking, like the social practice of all of this, like being able to share the blueprints drawings for nonprofits and spaces that can't afford uh, paying full price to something is, is key. Like that, that is my dream to be able to um, like have this full functioning furniture, but then just leave it on my website. And then anybody who would like, who has access to a maker space could make one really easily customize it. You know, I think that that is one of the most important things that could really problem solve. Um, it's not just making one and selling it to $5,000. It's like, you know, you don't question when you go to a restaurant, oh, they are gonna, what if they don't have a high chair, right? All restaurants have one. So it is really important to make it free and available and accessible um, as possible. Yeah, it should be in every single museum and right. every gallery and every university gallery and the library should also buy it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kelsey, I feel completely aligned. It's like if we know that these community driven spaces are the spaces where we're building the future and having these dreams that are about world building and making up the future, like, you know, the Adrian Marie Brown, like building the plane in flight. So if we're doing that, we need the spaces to be as imaginative as those conversations. And so often it's like for mica tables and fluorescent lighting, because people can't access this really wonderful environment that we all are creating. So yeah, I feel the same kind of dream to make the work for those spaces. And I think one way to make it financially feasible is to look at ways that we can also have city and government and municipal procurement for really radical makers and also have sponsorships like you all have today. And I want to say that um, if you all haven't looked at this thing called CETA, it's the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. There is a way that this is being brought back now, but it's where federal funding and municipal funding allows artists to be in residence in community organizations. And there's a pilot that started in Massachusetts that is now being spread nationally. So we can also call upon our elected officials to support this and people can make it with their UBIs. And there are many ways to think about um, financing it and supporting artists as members of the public who make public goods. So yeah, those are my dreams. I think there's a lot of alignment here and hopefully the three of us keep talking. I would love that. 
I'm furiously Googling to find the right CETA link here. <laughs> I can see which one is the best. So if, if Caroline, if you know the right one, feel free to drop that in the chat. <laughs> okay. And I see Reagan just contributed in the chat. Oh, I love this. Thanks for sharing, Caroline. Maybe I need to custom build my portable podium. <laughs> I am curious about the history of the podium and how this piece of furniture serves to legitimize the speaker. Um, I think that sounds like um, such a great project. Absolutely. Um, and with that, I can't believe it. We, we've gone through our preset questions. I also wonder if, if as we've been speaking, speakers, did, does this bring any questions to the forefront of your minds that are questions you'd like to pose to each other? Oh, and I see one, a new question in the chat from Robert Brancic. Caroline, you stayed, uh, started to create objects for office and workspaces before the pandemic. And I wonder if you can talk more about these interventions and your intentions, especially in relation to our return to work. That's a great question. Wow, yeah, thank you. And then I'm gonna put this nice link. If Ellen, if you look up Rachel Chanoff, you'll see the person who's doing the new CETA. Um, let me just, this is the person who's behind it while I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how much time I personally spend in meetings and how awful they are and also how ugly those spaces are. And so I started making these objects for groups and I have one here, it looks like a rock, but it goes in a bucket of water and you cap it and it's for a kind of grounding exercise. And during the pandemic, I mailed these to people and now they are going to be available in the free library of Philadelphia for anyone to check out with their library card. And there's an amazing enclosure that my friends Aisha, John Dezova, and Jeffrey U. Warren made that's in the background. I was not prepared to share that because it's not furniture. But I do think a lot about um, functional design. And I think since many people will never go back to work in person, I do think that furniture and home offices and architectural Zoom spaces are going to be more and more in the way people think about their home and domestic environments. I don't know what that will be, but I'm very excited to intervene in that. There's a ton of opportunity there. <laughs> Great. And again, I'll just encourage our audience members, if you want to drop anything in the chat, feel free. Um, oh, here's something from Lisa Brawley. Thank you for this conversation. Quick PS regarding the earlier question of accessibility and also of museums that do not have places to sit. Folks might be interested in this fab project by Shannon Finnegan. Do you want us here or not? <laughs> Which sounds like a very compelling project. Check out the link that Lisa put in the chat. Um. I will also say, I think too, just because the conversation has been so much about like what I would consider like commercial spaces versus like residential spaces. Um, I think like one of the things that's so, so interesting about having these conversations is for me, it's really inspiring and it kind of recenters and reminds me of like, oh yeah, and that is what the goal of furniture is. As I like sit in my apartment with like two sawhorses and a piece of plywood for a table, um, you know? And so I think it's just really inspiring to kind of like remind yourself of like kind of like the lofty goals that we all started out with and how we do tend to deviate from that. And then it is just like, yep, this is the place where I rest my glass. Um, and um, my question for Arzu and Caroline is like, um, what's the most terrible piece of furniture in your residential life? Such a good question. That's terrible, but super functional furniture that I have, and I had to purchase it because of the pandemic home office childcare situation is this giant pack and play where I can put my child <laughs> by my desk. <laughs> it's like a zoo stage <laughs> cage. <laughs> That's amazing. 
I love this question. I'm like, honestly, I don't know yet because I just moved to Berlin. So I don't know. I wish I had a great answer. I think um, everything is really well made, but it's too heavy. So I can't move it. So it looks like Ikea, but it's actually really well made. I don't know if you can see this, but it actually has like beautiful joinery. You might not be able to tell. Mm -hmm. But the thing is a beast. I can't even move it. <laughs> what about you, Kelsey? What's the worst one in your domestic space? Um. Okay. A big thing for me recently is when we went remote, I built myself a home office and I literally can't use it. Like I designed it and built it and I like don't spend any time in there. I, I work in the floor of my living room and dining room. Um, and yeah, I designed it and I built it and it's very pretty and idealized um, and I can't work there. <laughs> is it a mental block or is it physically not what you had hoped? Mm, okay, so it's, yeah, both. So number one, the windows look out onto um, the second police precinct in Minneapolis. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't want that view. Um, and, and, this, and that view has changed over the very dramatically over the course of the past year um and then two um there's just not enough um surface area for me i think i kind of designed the perfect home office for someone who um is like a full-time graphic designer and like doing computer work is um one part of my work and actually I do that part like on my laptop on the couch and like in a really horrible body posture um and so I don't even use it for that half of my work got it it's multifaceted this this challenge <laughs> oh I have a question for the two of you I would love to hear who you look to or who you look at in terms of like furniture design or it could be a sculptor it could be someone like what's something that comes to mind that you love? It could be like you put it in the chat or say it out loud, but yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put it in the chat, but I am really inspired by um, this set designer named Ad Goodrich. Do y'all know her? Um, I'm gonna put her, um, I guess like Instagram handle in the chat. Um, and she does a lot of temporary stuff. Um, so it's like sets for like music videos and stuff. And it's very um, playful. Exciting. I love new work. <laughs> I, I, I can only think about Mel Chin right now. I don't know why, but <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of any other names at this point. Mel Chin is, is a good one. Specific to <laughs> furniture. Yeah, I can't yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> Well, could be like architecture, anything like, you know, who are the like siblings or like parents or like spiritual ancestors of the furniture and the projects you want to make. Okay, Ooh, thanks, Bin Bin. Nice. Yeah, anybody in the audience who who's inspiring your favorite furniture works or the the ideas surrounding your your furniture too i should give bin bin a shout out bin bin's one of our alumni and she's going to be talking on friday so very exciting of course bin bin <laughs> oh good thanks caroline excellent all right, folks, we've got a couple minutes left. This is your last chance to, to talk or pose a question to these fantastic folks. I'll, I'll leave a little space there. Ooh, thanks, Joel. Excellent. Oh, Kinji makes fantastic work. For those in the audience that might not be familiar with Kinji, um, Kinji is a professor emeritus from Minneapolis College of Art and Design and is much beloved for his very interdisciplinary work. So, excellent. Okay. Well, this has been such a pleasure. Oh my goodness, what a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, 
if anyone is is wanting eager to rewatch re listen to this work we're going to throw the recording up on the same page where you registered so it'll be a, a resource that lives on and you can check this out and find folks's um contact information oh wonderful thank you everybody for your posts in the chat thank you especially to our speakers this evening um and with that have a gorgeous evening thank you all excellent bye thanks everybody. everyone thank you bye have a good night <laughs>